Good evening, everyone. What a delight to see so many people have come out to hear Kate Beaton tonight. Before we begin the evening, I would like to acknowledge what a privilege it is to gather here together in the Tim Center for the Arts in Edmonton, which is located on Treaty 6 territory and Region 4 of the Métis Nation of Alberta. This area, known by the Nehiawak as Amiskwachi Wiskegan, has long served as what they also call a pehonan, a gathering place, as well as a homeland, rich with many stories from many different indigenous nations, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Nakoda Sioux, Soto, Inuit, and Dene peoples. At the CLC, we strive to work in the spirit of this gathering place by celebrating and deepening our understanding of the diverse literatures that flourish in Canada, the many and varied forms of storytelling that expand our capacity to imagine what it means to live here together in this shared place. So we are grateful to be here, and we are especially grateful to our featured author and artist, Kate Beaton, who flew here with her family all the way from Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, to join us this evening. Now, none of this would be possible, of course, without the Faculty of Arts, which houses and supports the CLC and our wonderful part-time staff who make everything happen. So once again, with deep gratitude, I would like to welcome the Dean of the Faculty of Arts, Dr. Robert Wood, to, to the stage to say a few words before we begin. Thank you, Dr. Krotz. Good evening, everyone. My name is Robert Wood, and it's my privilege to serve as the Dean of the Faculty of Arts here at the University of Alberta. Welcome, and thank you for joining us tonight. As many of you know, the Cry as a Lecture is an annual event hosted by the Centre for Literatures in Canada, or Centre de Literature au Canada. This lecture series was established in memory of Professor Henry Kreisel. Professor Kreisel was Chair of English and Vice President Academic at the University of Alberta in the 1960s and 70s. Austrian-born and Jewish, Professor Kreisel was interned in Canada during the Second World War. As a war refugee, he spoke of being an accidental immigrant to Canada and how, as a newcomer, he went looking for Canadian literature, but no one could tell him where to find it. And so he took matters into his own hands, introducing and teaching the first courses in Canadian literature at the University of Alberta, inspiring a love of the written word in generations of students. Notably, he was also one of the first modern writers to introduce the immigrant experience to the field of Canadian literature. We are so thankful for the historic contributions of Professor Kreisel, as well as the support from members of his family. The CLC honors his legacy through the Kreisel Lecture Series, just as the Faculty of Arts is, is committed to honoring and supporting liter literary arts and spreading awareness about the importance and the value of Canadian literature. The annual Kreisel Lecture is not only a celebration of Canadian writing, but it's also a recognition of the importance of public intellectual exchange. In the Faculty of Arts, we are proud to be, to be the home of the CLC. This successful research centre tackles key societal issues in its role as the Western hub of the Canadian literary community. It's a forum for open, inclusive, critical thinking and cultural engagement. And it works to bring together authors, readers, researchers, students and teachers from across the country. I'd like to thank our friends at the CLC who make all of this possible, in particular Dr. Sarah wiley Crotz, who you just heard from, and her team at the CLC. Thank you as well to the University of Alberta Press, which co-publishes the Kreisel series with the Centre for Literatures in Canada. I also want to express my deep gratitude to Eric and Alexis Schloss for their generous founding gift and for their continued support over the years. Dr. Eric Schloss proposed the original concept and vision for the CLC because he saw the need for an organization devoted solely to the study and promotion of Canadian literatures in their widest context, nationally and internationally. In addition to donating more than 40,000 books to the University of Alberta libraries and supporting annual lectureships on human rights and the Holocaust, the Schlosses established the CLC in the Faculty of Arts in 2006, and it's the only national bilingual literature center in Canada. We remain forever grateful for their generosity. It's now my pleasure to welcome to the stage Professor Julie Rack, who will introduce our speaker tonight. 
Dr. Rack is currently serving as the chair of the Department of English and Film Studies. She's also a Henry Marshall Tory chair, and she is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. Dr. Rack's areas of expertise include diverse forms of modes of life writing in Canada, and she recently co-authored the Rutledge Introduction to Autobiography in Canada. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Professor Rack. Good evening, everyone. Kate Beaton is having a moment in Canada and beyond. Am I right? Am I? It's such an honor to get to introduce one of my favorite comics creators who has made an instant classic that resonates with so many people in Canada and everywhere else in the world of comics and in the rest of the world. Ducks, the story of Beaton's quest in 2005 to pay off her student loan by leaving her home in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia to work in the oil fields of northern Alberta is the autobiographical comic to read right now. The story was universally well-reviewed in 2023, and it won Best Artist and Best Graphic Memoir at the Eisner Awards, the most significant awards in the comics industry. It even became the first graphic book to win the CBC Annual Contest Canada Reads, defended brilliantly by Jeopardy's super champion and fellow Maritimer, Matei Roach. With that win, Ducks made the jump from the alternative comic scene where Beaton is well known for her web comics and her collection Hark a Vagrant to mainstream fame. This is really something for the creator of Sexy Batman and the send-ups of Nancy Drew book covers you find in Hark a Vagrant. And I still love Sexy Batman. Who doesn't love Sexy Batman? See? More seriously, there are many reasons why Ducks achieved almost immediate popular and critical success. The autobiographical comic appeared at a time when awareness of the impact of the oil fields on the economy and environment in Canada was sharply on the rise. Alberta, the province where most of the action of Ducks takes place, is constantly in world news because of oil production and its attendant controversies. Alberta itself is an important node of petroculture, a society built on the extraction of fossil fuels and that takes much of its meaning and identity from the labor for and environmental impact of extraction. Most of the time, the public discourse of Alberta figures oil either as the underpinning of all economic and social life, which must never be called into question, or it sees the oil and gas industry acting as the symbol of the environmental destruction and of economic and social boom-bust problems in Canada. The clash between the two points of view is usually figured in public discourse as a relatively simple choice between jobs or the environment. But there is another side to the oil and gas industry that is often disregarded as the conflict plays out the lives of oil-filled workers themselves, and what it is like for them to leave their homes and work in northern Alberta. And that is what Ducks is really about. As Kate Beaton eloquently points out, the production of oil is dependent on the extraction of labor from other parts of Canada and from the world. Oil mining and refining takes place on lands stolen from Indigenous people, another extraction. The system of extraction creates its own kinds of violence, alienation, and social problems, even as it brings a measure of prosperity for oil field workers. Kate Beaton shows all this in the medium of autobiographical comics. It has often been pointed out in comics scholarship that hand-drawn comics can't help but be autobiographical. The creator's body, even her soul, is in every line. Comics creators draw themselves and use the medium of comics to tell stories that can't be told any other way. Some of the best autobiographical comics ever produced are made in and about Canada by artists like Chester Brown, Julie Doucette, Seth, and Gillian Tamaki. Ducks therefore positions itself within this tradition at the center of ambiguity about jobs, labor, and the environment, and does not look for easy answers. It runs these huge issues through Beaton's own perspective as a young woman from a have-not region 
who wants a different future for herself as she works to pay her loan and figure out her life's work in the process. Beaton sets out to show us how there can be beauty in the midst of ugliness, sexism, violence, including against women and against the land. In the midst of community and camaraderie, there is a longing for home that cannot, for people like her from Atlantic Canada, ever be reconciled with economic realities. Quote, I learn that I can have opportunity or I can have home. I cannot have both and either will always hurt Beaton writes at the beginning of Ducks. The story that unfolds is a testament to the complexity of having to live with and through the realities of extraction. It is autobiographical storytelling at its finest, told by a master of comics as a medium. And so, with the greatest of admiration, please help me welcome to the stage, Kate Beaton. Thank you. Thank you for having me here tonight to the University of Alberta uh, for that wonderful introduction, uh, for the invitation and for the reception here to you all. I'm so glad to be here in Alberta tonight where truly a part of my soul will always be living. My neighbor tells a story that makes me laugh. When he was a kid, he and his family went to a restaurant for the first time in his life. It was very exciting. Order whatever you want. So he ordered bread and molasses. It wasn't on the menu, and the waitress was perplexed, but that's what they ate at home. That's what everyone ate at home, because it was cheap, and no one had any money. And we laughed because this is a child's social gaffe. You're supposed to order off the menu. You're supposed to know. This is a talk about class. And I can think of lots of times in my own life where I just did not know what I was supposed to know, according to those above me, and how that felt. But it works both ways. The knowledge deficit is on the other side as well. There's a famous history book uh, from 1963 called The Making of the English Working Class by E.P. Thompson. It was the big bang for a popular history from the bottom up instead of the great man version of history from the top. Its most famous quote is when Thompson says that he seeks to rescue poor workers from the enormous condescension of posterity. It's a good phrase. The subtext is that posterity belongs to the upper class. It's another way of saying that the off-quoted history is written by the victors, which I think is a quote mostly trotted out bitterly from the point of view of the losing side. We all feel our losses keenly. And so I say, as someone from the working class, that posterity in the arts belongs largely to the affluent. Not just success on a personal level, but the accumulation of people who have come from generational wealth versus those who do not. The people who create the bulk of what we consume and accept as our own culture over the years. The enormous condescension of posterity. Yes, that'll do. A few years ago, the Canada Council for the Arts published a large survey, a statistical profile of artists in Canada. The survey had information on a wide range of demographics, career profiles, age, gender, current income, education, ethnicity, immigration status, language and employment. However, Canada Council had nothing to say on class background. They've been under fire for being a classist organization for the get-go, so I must say I was a little surprised. Another survey. In 2022, the Association of Canadian Publishers produced this is a mouthful. The Canadian Book Publishing Industry Diversity Baseline Survey. <laughs> the results were about people working in the publishing industry, and they had a lot to say about where they worked in Canada, what age, what type of work they did, if they had a disability, what department they worked in, what race they identified as, what gender, what sexual orientation, their salary, type of contract, who held what positions of authority, and again, there was nothing on class background. Perhaps. That is a metric that is too hard to measure, too vague to define. Class is a system of ordering people based on social economic status, also perceived social or economic status. Perhaps it is asking too much to draw a line between classes when there are so many intersectionalities that permeate what we think of when we think of class, muddying an already hard to define status. I suppose 
that we do all have the low income cutoff line, which is a solid number, and other government socioeconomic benchmarks if we need them. And there is even just the feeling that yes, I was raised working class. It's not all about money after all. It's about where you're from, what your community looks like, what informs your tastes, what gives you the shorthand with which to navigate and network or be unable to network the social world around you or above you, as it were. You know who you are, but maybe that is not good enough. However, even with all those arguments and reasons to hedge around class, there is no denying that class is a reality in people's lives with enormous consequence. These surveys are just one example of the ways in which we ignore class in Canada when it could be part of the conversation. How can you define something that is made to be invisible to begin with? For the purpose of this talk, I should define for you what I mean when I say working class. It's an elastic term, even in my view. There's no one definition that satisfies. It was once the proletariat, people who only had their labor to sell as economic value, but not anymore. It used to mean people without post-secondary degrees, but many workers have those, or they have occupation-specific training. It used to conjure images of factories, but most working class people today are in the service industry. To cut off the working class from the poor and the middle class by one income amount feels arbitrary to individual experience. I think self-identification is what makes it. We work, but we are poor. We are working class. Even that has its issues. Wolfgang Lehmann, that's him, sociology professor at Western University, often found his subjects, who were working class students, unable to name themselves as, in fact, working class, even when there were obvious signifiers, as in they were the first in their families to go to university, and their parents were mechanics and beauticians. When asked, they supposed they might be middle class by virtue of having grown up in a house and having employed parents. This is backed up by the research. Last year, the Angus Reid Institute published a large survey on class in Canada. It found that most Canadians don't think or talk that much about social class, and most of us, for better or worse, consider ourselves as hewing towards the middle class, whether we are below it or above it. And isn't that who politicians are always talking to anyway? The average Canadian? But the same study also points out that class mobility is difficult in real life. And even though Canadians believe in meritocracy, believe in getting ahead through hard work, it's hard to get from the bottom to the top. Yet class division has always been central to our national makeup, whether we acknowledge it or not, often not. This is as true in the arts as much as anywhere. The economist, Carol Jan Borowiecki, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, did a survey of 160 years of US demographic data it told the obvious, but it showed it on paper. If you come from more money, you are more likely to become an artist than someone who did not. Someone who had a family income of $100,000 is twice as likely to become an artist, an actor, a musician, or an author than someone else from a family of $50,000. If you raise that income to a million dollars, you are 10 times more likely to become an artist. It's easy to understand why. To leap into a creative field is to walk into the arms of an industry that might not love you back financially. The stakes are high for someone with no money. If there is no one to catch you when you fall, it's just a choice that you can't make. You can only be a starving artist if you or your family are not actually, literally starving. The New York Times added a little finesse to this data with its own study of surveys finding in 2017 that way more young people pursuing an art career get a financial bump from their parents and, the, and a higher amount of it compared to their blue collar peers. In short, the arts is full of more people who come from wealthier backgrounds than not. People who in turn decide what stories are told, whose voices are heard, and in essence, who decides what our culture is. If class is not a part of the rubric of demographics of what we expect when we think of intersectionality and representation, then we are missing something critical we are not looking for distinct voices that make up a large portion of this country. We need to talk about class. I've been aware of class my entire life. My parents worked very hard for very little, but they would be the first to point out, it's not like anyone else had anything either. That's life in a working class community. As a child, you accept your life as normal, whatever the circumstances. If you have no money, 
It doesn't matter that nothing looks like the houses on TV. Nothing is ever new. That toy commercials mean nothing because, yeah, dream on. But you still know what's going on. If parents have anxiety over what to spend money on, kids are the first to tune in. I'm learning this because I have a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and kids are always listening. Class is there. It's in the backdrop. When you get older, though, you start to make your way in the wider world. Class reveals itself in sharp relief, especially in all the ways that you are found lacking, the connections that you don't have, the skills that you never learned, the accent you speak in, the way you look, and of course, the money you don't have and possibly never will. When I speak about class, this is how I understand it, really. This is how I know who I am. Today, I'm a cartoonist. That means that I'm a writer and an artist and an illustrator, and I get to do it all. I wanted so badly to be an artist from a young age. But I'm from a have-not place. At that young age, I had no resources. I didn't have the tools to navigate the system that I thought I needed to become what I wanted so badly. My village was small, and my school only had so much. They were used to sending the bright students off to teaching and nursing degrees, sensible choices in a place with limited options. The last thing that they wanted to do was set us up for failure by setting us off to a career in the arts, where they knew there was little that they could do to help us, and no money at home to carve a way to success. I said that I wanted to be an animator, and I think the guidance counselor and I both started sweating. <laughs> it was demoralizing. And I recall a sad scene in the small village museum where I worked in the summer, this one. My father came to drop off the uni university course packet that came in the mail on his lunch break. But the course packet was not the one that I longed for. I was going for a Bachelor of Arts instead of Fine Arts or d animation degree that I had longed for, the one that I had uh, dreamed of for years. With a BA, you can always be a teacher or a lawyer, so keep your doors open. Always keep your doors open. My father was proud to drop off the university mail, but I wept for my broken 17-year-old dreams, and he didn't know what to do. But what were my parents supposed to think anyway? They were nothing but supportive and proud, but they came from an even harder reality than I did. When my mother's oldest sister went away for work, the first thing that she did with her money was install a bathroom in the old house. Imagine the luxury that you think your kids have when you didn't have a bathroom. The first thing I did with my money, of course, was pay off my own fancy education. No print market would have wanted me when I started making comics. I was working in a camp in an oil sands mine. I was a woman from a poor town making crude looking comics on my time off because I had 12 hour shifts and I wasn't even that familiar with comics. Rural, poor places didn't have them. I had never had an art class and it showed. Nobody would have wanted me, I would have, I could smell the rejection letters baking in the oven. I had one stroke of fortune. The internet was, at that time anyway, a great equalizer. There were no gatekeepers. It was like jumping the turnstiles to get on the train. You just made these things and put them up and anyone in the world could look at them. And I was making these jokey comics about history and literature and things that I was interested in and something I started at university but posted online after I graduated. People who also liked these things responded in kind and it felt so good to be seen. I was doing it for nothing, for the joy of it. My day job was in a mine and living in a work camp and there was harassment and isolation and pollution and drugs and so many other things, but I put these comics up at night and people would see me as I wanted to be seen and that was worth so much. Then someone else who was making comics online in the same way started a company that sold merchandise for people's websites and invited me to be a part of it so I could make some income. And I did. And though my career changed a lot, I've been making comics for a living since 2008. It's a great shame that that window of time where the internet was open as it was when I came in shifted and shrank, and you can't do it that way anymore. I did get published eventually, after I was legitimized by popularity, got an agent, the works. But it wasn't just me who came in through the back door at that time. Without gatekeepers, 
The internet brought down class barriers, but it also gave similar entry and acclaim to queer people, racialized people, people telling stories that felt unmarketable or unprintable. Unprintable? Now comics, which used to be synonymous with white men, is one of the most diverse mediums we have, which is very cool. And now, being one of the rare artists who manages to come from the working class and make a living from creative work alone, I want to reflect on representation of people like me in literature where I'm from. I can't speak for class broadly as it spans the continent, but I can speak for myself, and I can tell you that representation or lack of it has an effect. It empowers or edifies you, or it stereotypes and diminishes you, or worse, it erases you. I said before that there are those who decide what our culture is, but behind that is another idea, a request, a need that we have, that culture should belong to everyone with the same authenticity and power. And it doesn't always work out that way. So let's go back, way, way back, woo, way back, to 1886. There's a travel article from Harper's New Monthly Magazine out of New York by one Charles H. Farnham. He's come to Cape Breton, my island, to get out of the flash and fizz of the city, those are his words, and look at people the way they used to live, simple people who aren't spoiled by modern noise. The article is called Cape Breton Folk. The thing about looking for something specific is that if you go that far to get it, your mind is made up and you might convince yourself that you found it no matter what you see. Farnham wants to see simple people, and so simple people he sees. He takes a lot in, wigs, marriages, festivals, scenery, and he gets to my village. And when I found this article, I was very excited. I was like, I can't wait to see what he sees when he gets to my village, because we don't have a lot of records of this kind of thing. But he gets there, and suddenly, the scenery isn't so scenic. They're driving over a cape, and it's high and windy, and the little rocks are tumbling in the water far below. The wind is demonic. He says it's all personified by a poor old man who's trying to farm something, and an artist drew the old man for us. Here's a quote. The life of the region seems to be personated. Personated? Oof by a withered old man whose ragged homespun hung on him as on a skeleton, and whose unkempt flocks flew about with the wind. He bent low over his scythe and with tragic eagerness tried to mow the few spears of wiry grass sticking up from the barren earth. A little more steepness and he had rolled into the sea as the stones did. A little more wind and he had whirled away as the leaves of November. Then he says, Night seemed more in harmony with such bleak poverty than the glory of sunset. It enshrouded us all as we threaded our way homeward up one of the glens. So then he, he travels to the next tale. And he says, Waikagama was doubly charming after the bleakness of the sea coast <laughs> and the fatigue of travel. I settled down in a comfortable inn to continue my rambles in Cape Breton through the Indian summer. This is one of the prettiest places on the island. He had to look at poor people. Yuck. <laughs> Ugh. That made him sad. Sad as the night. He came to see delightful, wee, simple folk, not gross poverty. <laughs> but then he woke up at a charming inn in a more affluent village, and that made things better. New day, new adventures for our man Charles. Uh, I'm going to pause here. We're going to put a pin and the withered old man in ragged homespun, holding a scythe, poor man in my home village. I don't want you to feel too bad for my forebears, not even the ragged old man on the cliff. The village in which Charles Farnham landed and found a comfortable inn at the end of that passage was Rikogama. That's a 30 minute drive from my house right now. He finds it, as he says, beautiful and prosperous. Ooh, but this is Canada. And in Canada, we should know that a darker truth is underneath that. The truth is that Waikagama, beautiful as it was, was an indigenous settlement, a Mi'kmaq reserve. 
but it had been encroached on and taken by white squatters who neither cared that the Cape Breton, Unamagi, was unceded land as a whole or that the reservation specifically was not theirs. Around that time, estimates suggest that half of Cape Breton was settled by squatting. The settlers either had no money to petition for land or the system was not set up to accommodate them, so they just squatted. Chief Peter Gugu of Waikagama wrote a petition to the Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia in 1885. This is it. Appealing for help because the squatters were taking land that was precious to them, some of it already cultivated, and they were in fear of their future. No help came. But another petition came out two years later, this one from the settlers themselves, asking the government officially for more Mi'kmaq land, because in their opinion, they were best suited to civilize the area, and the natives were dying anyway. And this is that petition. It's signed by a lot of people. Today, we acknowledge that we are on unceded indigenous land nationwide, but we are still entrenched in a racialized society harmed by the violence of colonialism. The third signature on that second petition is a beaten. I don't know who he is exactly, but he is a potent reminder of who I am. Heir of the colonizer and a beneficiary of the system that they created. Class does not exist alone. It has many bedfellows and race is the most intertwined among them. There is no talking about class without talking about race. To talk to you about class from my perspective, I can't voice the experience of being racialized. That's a double barrel of society's treatment I have not had to look down. I'm white with a settler history 200 years long, but I know that history. Everything that I love and cherish comes from the moment that someone came up a boat and took land that wasn't theirs. Everyone was poor, but this is the truth about class as well. Poor white people have always been the first in line, class-wise, to receive the benefit of the doubt, the leg up, the open door, the extended hand. I've benefited from that fact, as sure as I'm standing here in front of you right now. Side note, the indigenous settlement of Waikagama is now Wikimac First Nation and it is currently situated directly alongside the village of Waikagama, the village that consumed their land. For decades, they have been trying to address the issue of stolen land that was taken from them by squatters and ignored by the government. And although it was not yet rectified, it is their land, and they're working on it. This is not to vilify one village because this happened everywhere and is barely acknowledged even now. And though I can't tell you personal things about or outside of my experience, I can tell you more facts. We're back to facts. That Canada Council Arts Survey found that racialized Canadians are underrepresented among all artists, 15% compared to 21% of all workers. Indigenous and immigrant workers are slightly underrepresented among artists. These facts can sit independently of class, but often there's a relationship. And do you remember that 2022 Association of Publishers Canadian Book Publishing Industry Diversity Baseline Survey? Well, it didn't account for class in the publishing industry, but it did note that 75% of respondents were white, an overwhelming majority. 70% of the population ticked the national census as white, but not in big cities like Toronto or Vancouver, where it was more like 40%. So 70% of the population coast to coast might be white, but I don't know how many publishing houses are in the corncob fields in Ontario. They're more likely to be in places that are diverse. I'm not saying this is a gotcha moment, the publishing figures only look slightly higher than the national ones. I'm just saying that there are different ways of looking at statistics. Bias is like Waldo, he's everywhere. If you look for him, he's got a little hat. Glasses. More figures. Non-white is not a group, of course. If you look at these surveys, you'll find other things, like in the Canadian census, 4.3% of the population is black, but in the publishing survey, only 2.6% of the responders were black. Those differences matter, they tell a story. The most diverse department in all of publishing, perhaps unsurprisingly, is interns, the newest and lowest paid of all, and the ones who may not make it career-wise. Let's go back to the pen. It's 1886, and the ragged man with the scythe is put Charles Farnham off his lunch. 
He's attempting to mow a few spears from the barren earth before the wind blows his skeletal frame into the sea. Charles departs for greener pastures. The man has left where he is. He has no interiority. He's just tragic. This kind of travel writing is uh, common about Cape Breton, and we'll get more into that. But by its very nature, travel writing is all about looking at things, and the main character is the writer. It interprets what the writer sees through the writer's lens. It assigns value through the writer. It can only give you so much. But the man has interiority, a family, a community, a culture. And in a way, we can let him speak for himself. I don't know who this man is, but I can introduce you to my great, great, great grandfather. His name was Angus McAllister, and he was a bard, a poet. He was born in Mabu in 1817, the same place I was born 166 years later. We are lucky that any of his songs survived. He was not fluent in English. Gaelic was his tongue, which is the case for many in the area. He was a protege of Alan the Ridge, famous poet of the region. I understand your mileage on famous. They vary. <laughs> and when that guy left the village and uh, the two poets parted, Angus bought his farm, and it was, unfortunately, kind of a shitty farm. <laughs> but to be fair, the crop blight of the 1840s was making farming difficult for anybody to get it under. And so Angus, poor and blighted, put pen to paper and wrote this. Oren do Raske Avara, the song to the crop failure. And in this, he's writing about really hard times. He's not flinching away from the reality of poverty and the devastating effects of the crop failure that gives the song its title. The potatoes are blackened. The wheat and the oats won't grow. Disease takes the cattle. It's bad. But there's humor here. He wants a drink in the ca at the tavern, but he can't have it. There's no money. But by the end of the song, his wife winks. She goes to the chest, and she pulls out a hidden bottle of whiskey. <laughs> and then she pull, pours him a big old drink, and she says, chin up. And he... And he, he <laughs> He has a big swig, and, and then he, everywhere he looks, good fortune, and poverty is gone. And that's how... <laughs> All right. But the line that I like the most is when he said, things are so bad here that I can't grow anything but children. <laughs> it's a funny line. And... He would know he had nine. <laughs> well, you wouldn't suppose there was humor through the hardship if all you had was that travel writer's brief disdain. Well, let people speak for themselves. Of course, of these two accounts of poverty in Mabu at that time, one was published by a writer in a famous magazine we all recognize the name of. Even now, if you Google it, you can find it. It has a wider cultural cachet, no matter how archival it becomes. The other is housed only in the physical special collections at St. Francis Xavier University's Celtic Studies Department, or in the tiny museum in my home village, or in memory. If you want to understand what life was like at that time, it would, would not be hard to look for one, but if you have to look very, very, very hard for the other one, even 150 years later, Class is power. There's a funny reoccurrence in medieval bestiaries. Change the subject. <laughs> and a bestiary is, uh, if you don't know, it's, a, it's animal drawings. So the funny reoccurrence is elephants. A lot of artists who drew the bestiaries had never seen an elephant. Why would they? They were European monks who lived in monasteries but they were charged with producing an image of one based on what they were told. So, okay, you've heard what an elephant looks like. It's a four-legged animal, large, two big ears, enormous tusks, tail, and most curious of all, a long nose, like a trumpet or a hose, I don't know. What would your drawing look like if you knew what an elephant looked like, but you didn't know what an elephant looked like? The answer is, Bizarre. Bizarre. Anything between a giant pig, horse, 
dog or boar, but something crazy coming out of its face. The modern viewer knows that these are elephants, but they also know these are not elephants. <laughs> and this is how I feel sometimes looking at portrayals of the working class or poor people when they are written by somebody just going off of what they have heard. Those middle class writers who give us so many of our lower class characters. They're writing off of an idea and other images and books and media that they have consumed that told them this is what it is. They don't need to live it. They have the authority that comes with looking down. How many more depictions of poor people do we need to see how their economic status, their poverty, is a personal failure instead of a systematic one? It is inherent in how they are bad parents, addicted to something, lazy or stupid or dirty or crude or violent compared to their middle class counterparts. How many times are they an object of ridicule? How many times have we looked into a working class home on television or a movie and seen a bleak hole where a family should be? No, you don't want to live there. Defined by everything that they do not have, according to their betters. You maybe want to hear about the one who escaped all this, not the ones who live it. The one who is palatable is the one who is different than all the rest. And it is all about what reinforces a sense of superiority, what brings on pity or disgust instead of a social consciousness of other people's circumstances. How can we reveal a truer culture with empathy and understanding of one another without a real understanding of one another's circumstances? If there is no authentic representation, then all you have are medieval drawings of elephants. Earlier generations of writing in Cape Breton did not trade so much in the stereotypes of lower classes as we have now, people as failures. They had a different image in mind, that of the folk. What do I mean when I say the folk? Let's get into it. There's a seminal work from 1994 called Quest of the Folk by Ian McKay that has influenced all writing around literature about Atlanta, Canada since it was published. It is very hard to find a bibliography without it. Quest of the Folk comes for us all. <laughs> it came for me on a syllabus in an uh, anthropology folklore course in university. It's so popular because it, it lays bare the machine that helped create uh, Nova Scotia as a place of the mythic folk ideal, that of the backwards rural people, simple, friendly, and pre-industrial, living in a golden age the rest of the country is sentimental for and ready to be discovered. Charles Farnham was not the first or the last to land in Nova Scotia in search of simple people living a simple life somewhere back in time. And McKay's book goes heavy in the ring with folklorist Helen Creighton, who scoured rural Nova Scotia for folk songs and folklore during her career in the early 20th century, but selected for publication only that which she deemed authentic and appropriate to her taste. That taste was very conservative, sanitized, and racially selective. Her work was very popular and helped promote an anti-modern aesthetic for the region, which was uh, the middle class and outsiders flocked to. But it did not represent the reality, which was modernizing, industrializing, racially diverse, and often cruder than she would allow. McKay argues a strong case that Nova Scotia commodified a folk culture for tourism and commercial interests, especially during the time of Premier Angus L. Macdonald, but continuing ever since. In these images and texts, the province looks bucolic, purposefully stuck in the past, often very white, particularly Scottish or Acadian, erasing indigenous people in black communities and other immigrant settlers. Yet the oldest black communities in Canada are situated in Nova Scotia. In all these arguments, McKay is very on the money. The folklorists all came from the middle class. They had the equipment and the cars to drive around because they had the leisure to do so. They could publish books about what they chose to include as culture and what they chose to omit. But we all had Helen Creighton's books growing up, and everyone else did too. And I remember wishing that Helen Creighton had come to my town because the people in those books all had a record of themselves on paper where we did not. It felt like proof of something. That's all I knew. You also can't deny the impact of tourism images and literature on how the rest of the world sees us and how we see ourselves in the world. 
McKay writes of the Nova Scotia folk that they live generally in fishing and farming communities, supposedly far removed from capitalist social relations and the stresses of modernity. The folk did not work in factories, coal mines, lobster canneries, domestic service. They were rooted to the soil and the rock-bound coast, and they lived lives of self-sufficiency, close to nature. You can conjure that in your mind. You've seen it. It's an East Coast postcard. It's beautiful, powerful image, a pervasive one. But if that was who we were, if that was how the rest of the country saw us as backward rural simpletons, then you know how it affected the way that people were allowed to live their lives. Not distant, but different. <laughs> Should those people in that image make decisions for themselves? No, they're too backward. Should they aspire to more? No, they're stuck where they are, but they like it. Should they have a voice? No, better educated people should talk for them. The maritime provinces are always accused of being too sentimental for their own good, as if that, at its core, wasn't also something partially manufactured and put on them by people who wanted it that way. I also think that Cape Breton has just always existed in the imagination of people in and outside of all this as a refuge from modernity by its very geography. If you look at it on the map, islands carry their own romance, and there on the edge of the continent, it looks like a place to get away from it all. In the 1950s, Timothy Ash, a young anthropologist, not a tourist, would later become famous in his field. He was sent to my village to document the way people used to live, because there, they still live that way. They were an official control group for the past. So let's go on a trip. Go on a trip. With Edna Stabler. A friend of mine handed me a book by Edna Stabler called Cape Breton Harbor. This is a book published in 1972 chronicling Stabler's visit to Neal Harbor, a fishing village in northern Cape Breton. Edna Stabler is a well-known, so she was, a well-known Canadian journalist from Kitchener, Ontario. She wrote for publications like Chatelaine, but she's best known for a cookbook called Food That Really Schmecks. <laughs> yeah, some fans. <laughs> she helped found the literary journal The New Quarterly, along with Farley Mowat and Harold Horwood. Uh, Wilfrid Laurier University has a creative writing award in her name. But in 1948, she was yet unpublished and she was visiting Cape Breton and she was taking notes for what would be her first ever published article, a piece from Maclean's magazine that would jumpstart her career. The book about this visit was published years later in 1972. Among all her writings, she said that this was her favorite. And it is an interesting book to read today. Not because it's famous, but because of the way that it's written and how much she shows her hand. Stabler was coming to the island on vacation. She may have been writing in 1948, but the book was published only a decade before I was born. The copy on the back, the marketing, tells you a lot immediately. The spell of the sea will be on you as you read this finely illustrated story of Edna Stabler's discovery of a fishing village on the Cabot Trail, like a seashell or a pocket full of sand. This book will talk to you of people, the sound of gulls in the sea long after you have read it. She grew to love the people who in turn accepted her into their lives. Here's an intimate look at what many people mean when they think of the Maritimes. Ooh, count me in. Uh, well, it certainly paints a picture. It evokes McKay's The Folk, to be sure. Um, you, like you pick up a rock, oh my god, a fishing bill. <laughs> I found it. Its dust jacket is written for the middle class to come out of the city and discover something more primitive. When she lands in Neal's Harbor, she thinks it's ugly and poor and the food is bad. She learns to love it and appreciate it quickly. And that, you might say, is the point of the book. However, we as the reader, we take what we are given and we are told that it is a dump right away and so we have to believe it, especially since if we are the upper Canadian middle class to whom this book is marketed. When she says right away, I certainly won't stay here a week, I won't even unpack my bags, the Red Malcolm woman is hostile, the fishermen might be filthy old men and I won't be safe in their boats, the glitter on the sea is menacing. <laughs> what are we supposed to think? She changes her mind, to be sure, but we are never not looking at these people the way that she is looking at them. 
An interesting feature of this book is that for its entire length, the local people speak in phonetic dialogue with their an accents painstakingly spelled out. Not every single word, but it also is happening all the time. This is done in the name of authenticity, or as her contemporaries would have it, immersive journalism. I, if you can read this, it's very intense. It's very a lot. <laughs> Treat yourself. <laughs> Pierre Burton said that Edna immerses herself in the story. She becomes part of the narrative. She lives the lives of the people that she writes about. She listens to their problems, and they become her friends. To Pierre Burton, she broke boundaries. And she did break boundaries. She was a pioneer of literary journalism. She was a woman in a field heavily dominated by men. She worked hard at it. It was also clear that Edna Stabler loved Kay Breton. Her biography makes that explicit. When her marriage was souring, she wrote in a letter to a friend, I want much of the time to run away, to find the joy I had when I was in Neal's Harbor. She would go back, and she felt more at home there than anywhere. Contentment, she felt welcomed, and she was welcomed. So I don't mean to pick on poor Edna Stabler. Certainly, there are many more villainous writers who can prove the point. This is a big chunk of the 20th century. Travel writers everywhere are gallivanting and they are writing things that horrify the modern eye. Try Margaret Warner Wally's 1900 book, Down North and Up Along, where she, a biologist, indulges in her own personal race theory throughout. Thanks, I hate it. <laughs> How about 1948's Cape Breton Isle of Romance by Arthur Walworth? The New York Times says, it gives a leisurely, intimate view of the semi-primeval life of the Scotch, Irish, French, and Mi'kmaq Indians who occupy the island. This man has a Pulitzer Prize in literature. They give those to anybody. <laughs> now, Edna Stabler is interesting because she is not so easily dismissed like some of these others. She loved Cape Breton. She tried hard to engage with people, and as a person, with a writing career, you, you root for her to succeed. But she still can't escape the fact that wherever she looks, she is applying a certain gaze. So there is a branch of philosophy called hermeneutics. And broadly speaking, it is the study of interpretation. It is the creation of understanding through the process of interpretation or making sense of something. Because we do not really look at anything, wow, we don't look at anything in this world with innocent eyes. Everything that we see is processed through a knowledge center of information that we already have so that we can make sense of what we encounter. And it only makes sense to you, the person, via everything that you already know. We can learn new things. We're always learning new things. But we are also always taking in information mostly to be understood within the limited parameters of the body of knowledge we already possess. Does that make sense? <laughs> You couldn't even go to Mars and be the first person on Mars without an idea of what it's going to be like when you get there because we all have information in our head already about Mars, even though no one has ever set foot on it. I hear it's red. <laughs> so what I mean to say is I think that Edna Stabler came and she saw something she loved and wrote about it as she saw fit. She wrote as she understood how to write about what she was seeing. She had a knowledge of things like poor people, fishing village, rural places, from everything that she had gathered in her life. And when she arrived in a village she had never seen before, she processed that information accordingly. I think in some ways she wrote the only book that she could ever write. After all, what would she have encountered beforehand from the perspective of anyone there? Not much. Maybe Each Man's Son by Hugh McClellan. McClellan. There's a lot of Macs around, we were messing them up. A cultural revival was going to happen that would produce writers that I will talk about later, but at this point it was still nascent. So what else was Edna Stabler gonna write? She wrote what she knew. Stabler's book made me think about working class characters in Dickens, because they often spoke in full phonetic accents. And they were sympathetic characters, because if you 
were a Canadian writer born in the early 20th century, like Edna was, I think that's what you've read. I don't think the decision to write full phonetic speech for working class or the poor comes out of nowhere. It's something you've seen before and learn this is the way to do it. George Orwell wrote an essay once on how Dickens handled the working class in his books. They were similar writers, in a sense. And he notes that even though Charles Dickens had a great admiration for the working class and definitely in his writing, he gives himself away in his memoirs. Dickens was famous for having to work in a factory as a child when his father was in debtor's prison. And privately, he wrote how much this hurt him. But what hurt him the most was being as low as the other boys. What gave him hope was being separated from them when the men would call him the young gentleman. And so, says Orwell, however much Dickens may admire the working classes, he does not wish to resemble them. And there it is. As much as you might admire, enjoy the company of, or feel at home with the working class, these writers don't want to be them, could never be them. The authenticity on the page is the author's alone. If you gave someone from Neal's Harbor a chance to write a book about Edna Stabler's three weeks there, would they write everything that they say to sound different than what you sound like? Probably not. Would they introduce their village to the reader as a desolate dump? Probably not. But they were also busy working. Well, she was there for three weeks on a summer holiday, which is still the case in Cape Breton and everywhere in the rural Maritimes, places that burst with visitors all summer. Who muse at the lifestyle? Oh, it's so nice here. While everyone else is working and often specifically working for them. And yet, and yet, on whose shelf is this 50-year-old book still standing? I would say most of the book collections of the casual readers of Upper Canada or wherever, we're making real villains of Upper Canada because we're in Alberta. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine those book collections have long dusted this one off the shelves. But I got it from a friend who had it in her bookstore in Cape Breton where people often pick up used copies with interest. And I do guarantee that people in Neal's Harbor have this book, they most of all, because we all want to be represented. If you don't have people's authentic voice, then other people will come in to fill the gap. And if that is all you have to see yourself with, or if that is the majority of what you are going to get, then you will never feel fully realized and seen in the larger culture. You will always be a caricature of some kind, pass through the lens of someone different, and maybe someone who can't even help but feel better than you. And you know that that is consequently how others will perceive you as well. When you look outside of your small world, there will always be people looking back at you. But to be beholden to what they think they see or what they want to see, instead of being able to speak for yourself, is a terrible price for just having less. I said there was a cultural revival in the last part of the 20th century in Cape Breton. And there was a remarkable growth in regional consciousness. It's hard to give this a ground zero. There was a result of many factors, and I don't think it was an uncommon thing for working class places or any place at anywhere at this time with the effects of modernization and globalization. We had our coal strikes and our labor leaders. We had television and radio and an influx of ideas and stories that showed what was possible. We had more students going to university than ever after the creation of the student loan programs in the 1960s. Government organizations were created with the arts in mind. We had a sharp, homegrown satirical comedy that was wildly popular in the home circuit. The American counterculture came, and both in the media and with the wave of actual draft dodgers. We had artists who moved in, ironically brought in by the popular imagination of Cape Breton as a place to escape a modernity, but oh well. People like uh, Robert Frank, June Lee, Philip Glass, Ken Nishi, Joan Jonas, Richard Serra, Joanne Acolytus. Music positively exploded onto the national stage. There was definitely something happening by the time I was born. With that culture came writers. And so I want to take a few of them and talk about how they related to issues of class, speaking from my lifetime as an Islander. Alistair MacLeod, Rita Joe, Sheldon Curry, and Lynn Cody, who you had here. Let's be clear, though, this is only a selection. Cape Breton has always had writers and artists to tell their stories. So first of all, if I were to cast a net over the country and ask what name comes to mind, I'd, I'd say it's hard to speak Cape Breton literature without the mention of Alistair MacLeod. 
For some, he is synonymous with the island, though his subject matter is narrowly focused on one type of community. He wrote on a great deal of things, family, labor, culture, loss, love. When he wrote about characters who were hard rock miners, you knew it had something true behind it because he was a miner before he was a professor. Class was a concern of his from the very start. Take his short story, The Boat, from 1968. I had to read The Boat in high school. That wasn't the Cape Breton that I knew. It was darker and emotionally colder and violent, but I knew the tourists who took pictures of people working. I knew the terrible choice between staying or leaving for somewhere better only to break the heart of someone you love of your, or your own heart. This was always going to be a concern of mine and everyone that I knew to stay or to leave to leave with opportunity and change, but loss or grief or to stay, to have home, but be left behind and be poor and never knowing. Alistair's characters often deal with the dilemmas of class and there are lines that I never shook because they hit something so true to my community, true to economic struggle, true to suffering the blows of capitalism which break your family apart or the things you know because they are made to be irrelevant. But he was writing very specifically about the area of my community so that makes sense, and we'll come back to him. In 1978, Rita Jo published her first collections of poems, including her most famous one, I Lost My Talk. This, too, is a school staple. She has the Order of Canada, and lines from this poem were included in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's report on residential schools in Canada. I lost my talk, the talk you took away when I was a little girl at Shubin Acadie School. I was only a housewife with a dream of bringing laughter to the sad eyes of my people. That is how Rita Jo described herself, but she was much more than that. A few years ago, I did a creative workshop, a creative writing workshop with some teenagers, some high schoolers from Eskasoni, a reserve town where Rita Jo lived many years of her life. Teenagers are terrifying. <laughs> And they are silent in a group setting when you're trying to get them to share creative chatter. So there wasn't a lot forthcoming. However, after it was over, two friends from a group of three girls came forward. And I had noticed them all together. They came over to me and informed me that their other friend was ready to see me now. That's what they said. They're ready to see you now. <laughs> she was waiting outside, nervous but willing to recite a poem that she wrote. And she did. And what did I think, she asked. I thought it was great, and I thought it took great courage to do what she just did. And of course, Rita Jo came to mind, and of course she said that was one of her heroes. It is maybe just a little bit easier to be courageous when one of the most famous poets is from your town. It tells you that your voice matters too. When I think of that girl, I hope she is still using that powerful voice, and I'm glad I got to hear it. But more to the point, I hope that if she wants to be heard, there is a way for that to happen. That the barriers that normally exist for an author who is indigenous and from a statistically impoverished community to things that are related are considered and mitigated by an industry that doesn't seem to see class. We celebrate Rita Jo as we should, but do we make way for others like her? In 1979, Sheldon Curry publishes the Glace Bay Miners Museum. This is only a few years after Edna Stabler's Cape Breton Harbor, and when the characters speak, it is sometimes with a phonetic spelling of their accent to highlight the fact that this is Glace Bay, where there is a heavy accent. There is a world of difference, though. Curry is judicious in where he deploys this device. It does not show up on every page, and where it does, a local Cape Bretoner can hear that distinct Glace Bay sound. In other words, it makes sense. It contextualizes, it territorializes. Looking at it, I think, I know what this is. It's almost made more for me, a local reader, than it is for an outside one. He didn't need to do it, and other novels set in Glace Bay don't do it and get along fine. You'll never find Alistair MacLeod's characters talking in an accent. You'll hardly find them talking in contractions. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> Authors can have different styles of writing, but the fact is that the difference is clear. It wasn't the writing of accents that I had a problem with, it was the gaze. Sheldon Curry writes with real authority, and it shows. The Glace Bay Miners Museum is funny and it's horrifying. It was written about a decade after the real Glace Bay Miners Museum opened to the public. Sheldon Curry has a lot to say about the reality of mining versus what the public can handle and tolerate or will tolerate. The actual Miners Museum will take you into a mine and will give you a story that you can take. It is a family outing. It was created 
for the Expo 67, the celebration. But the museum that Margaret McNeil, the main character in the story, creates is different. Margaret and Sheldon Curry want visitors to look at the unbearable reality of the work. Her museum is grotesque, and the events of her life are violent and tragic. There will be other stories about the tragic side of life in a coal town after Glace Bay Miners Museum. It seems that this is what the culture has an appetite for, both within ourselves and without. It certainly seems that to be prestige, prestigious, on the literary scene, you must open a wound, that if you are poor, you are miserable. But the culmination of these stories obscure the fact that places like Glace Bay or Sydney or New Waterford, mining towns, steel towns, were also functioning communities where many people did have happy lives, where they lived with great familiarity and camaraderie, played sports together, made music together, supported one another, laughed a lot, and missed it when it was gone. I wish that we had an appetite for this as well. In 1998, Lynn Cody's career takes off with the novel Strange Heaven. Lynn Cody was a new kind of writer coming out of Atlantic Canada. She was funny and angry and young and a woman. And in both, in various works, she was interrogating what she thinks of and what you think of about Cape Breton. Both Cape Breton as a living region and an idea in people's minds. Lynn grew up in Port Hawkesbury in the 80s, which was, as she puts it, a shit time to grow up in Port Hawkesbury. <laughs> This was a paper mill town that had seen better days. I also know Port Hawkesbury very well. It was bigger than the little villages that we grew up in, but only an hour down the road, and the paper mill had the best jobs. You were doing really good if you got on there. So when Lynn started writing stories set at home, it was exciting, and it was very present. It was also, I think the word get gritty gets used a lot. It's very gritty. Her stories are gritty. But I think it's more like this. She just didn't hold back. She portrayed people in a way that she knew, and if you lived there, you knew people like that too. There's nothing surprising here in the people that we meet, only in recognition. Poor people from the working class. They get to be no more or less complicated or disappointing than anyone anywhere else. If your mental image of the Maritimes was one of stereotype pleasantness, then yes, you might find it gritty. But I think that reaction is telling. It is unsettling to have an image overturned. In her 2000 story, A Great Man's Passing, I see a lot of the class issues that I've mulled over in my life cracked open and examined. A grandfather has died, the titular man. The narrator lives at home with the rest of the poor side of the family and wealthier, culturally distant cousins travel in for the funeral from Ontario and Boston. A rich American employs the narrator. He loves it in Cape Breton. He came to retire here. He's oblivious to the hardship around him. On TV, men grovel for work with humiliating familiarity. And the house that opens the story is falling apart, but a lot of people live in it. There's impotent anger and guilt in the air because things just aren't better than they are. And yet you can't help but laugh when someone at the bar that the narrator works at yells, fight! <laughs> and the horrified American looks on while two locals kick each other in the head outside to a delighted crowd. <laughs> so true. <laughs> Perhaps the worst commentary is saved for the characters who are almost Cape Bretoners themselves. The better off cousins from far away who only come to visit once a year or every few years, but when they do come, they come with their romantic notions of what Cape Breton is. They play act, they put on accents they don't have, they laugh loud, they drink local beer, they listen to fiddly folk music, they go to square dances and pretend that they are from a place that they were never from. They believe that their grandfather was a great man when he was an ordinary, decrepit old man, if anything, and they put the folk gaze on everything around them because that is what they want this place to be, not what it is. And this is family. One of Lynn Cody's strengths is disassembling what anyone thinks the family ought to look like and behave, and this is particularly savage, in my opinion, because we all have those cousins from away who are more Cape Breton than even we are. We all have encountered people who leave and come back and do this. And as I said, when you are almost faced with that choice of staying or leaving and what it will mean for your life or your children's lives, there is this powerful specter in this story that I think no one is unaware of, but no one explicitly talks about, that you or yours will become one of these distant, grasping, unmoored relatives in the story that you, that you know she pulled from life with all your money and not a clue. In 1999, Alistair MacLeod, he's back. <laughs> he writes his one novel, No Great Mischief. It's a very big deal at the time, the master's masterwork. 
international acclaim. Class struggle was at a very heart. But I learned a lesson very early on from this book about how people read. That once a book is out of your hands, it's gone. It becomes whatever other people say it is. And if we are talking in terms of class, you could write the very soul of your experience on a page and someone could read it and still see something completely different because that was never their life. You can't control what people read even when the words are on the page in front of them. I was still in high school when No Great Mischief came out. I remember my mother reading it and she couldn't put it down. It's just like my own relatives, she said. She was seeing herself in this book in a real way, in a rare way to her. I know one thing that stood out to her was the way that the older brothers of the protagonist of the book live. They're poor. They live alone. They're rural. They play the card game auction. They live in very rough. They sleep in their clothes and use overcoats for makeshift extra blankets. A horse pulls out someone's rotten tooth that was tied to a string. It's so cold in their house that they would wake up to frost on the inside of the walls. They never had cups where the handles weren't broken. They drink at a tea, or they drink their tea from jam jars. And they were alcoholics. My mother saw pieces of her uncles here, or other people that she knew, and the frost-covered nails in the farmhouse of her own life. As I grew older, there were some people in my own life who seemed to walk out of this book. But of course, it was only because Alistair had tapped into something like a pure vein of experience is common enough among people like me. In my own uncle's apartment in Ontario, only months ago, I remembered no great mischief. And yet I remembered another thing that happened that summer in high school when the book came out. I walked up to a tourist in Cape Breton who was looking for directions. She had rolled down her car window. This was the year 2000, before the GPS. And do you speak Gaelic, she asked me. But she didn't say it with a Cape Breton accent. <laughs> <laughs> And do you speak Gaelic, she asked me. A little, I said. Oh my God, I recall her saying almost to herself. She pulled her head back in the car. I just got here and I already met one of them. And she drove off. <laughs> and I stood there stunned for a minute, but I knew one thing for sure, that that woman had read No Great Mischief. 100%. I knew because I worked at the museum, like I said, in that little museum in the village. I knew that summer because of that book had brought in tourists. And for her and some others, it was like we had read two different books. What was so real and so raw to my mother was so romantic and selective to a different audience. The painfully sharp specific working class portrait carved by McLeod from my mom was a soft thing seen from a distance for others. And standing there, I felt like something to be seen on a human safari. She didn't read the book and remember the cold in the morning when you could see your breath in the house. She had never felt that cold. That was a fantasy. Now, I don't know that woman. Maybe she comes from a family of hard rock miners in Elliott Lake or the violence of the job they know so well and the social forces that put you there when other people would never do that work. But I really, I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it. You don't have to be from the same class to understand a book. We ought to read books from people of all different backgrounds than ourselves. It will make us a better society. But that was where I learned that you can't help what other people see because we all read books in our own way. We all make sense of what we see based on who we are already. But you have to try, though. And maybe what I'm really talking about is just another way of saying that we need more art from the working class, from working class artists, so that things stop feeling like a fantasy and are a reality that we accept instead. Now I would like to, in this last part, talk about my own experience directly. My 2022 graphic novel was Ducks. It was a memoir that dealt with the many realities of the working class through the eyes of my 21-year-old self working in the U.S. hands in Alberta. So over 400 pages of comics that comment on a number of things, class was among them. Also gender, corporate and government power, labor, money, how we treat each other in isolation, mental health, drug abuse, sexual violence, indigenous health, environmental concerns. There were many things that I tried to address, but everything had to be true to the experience and viewpoint of my younger and experienced self. Even though I tried to present a picture 
an even picture with coworkers who joke around and moments of levity. The book is often heavy. There is a sexual assault. There are moments of despair. There's addiction and racism and indifference. It's a hard look at an industry and a life that a lot of people have never had to think about. And in Ducks, I portrayed an industry that touched the lives of so many people from my home. The oil sands took people away, made empty desks in the schools, familiar faces disappeared from the streets, lifted fathers from their families. It was such a common story, all in the name of getting ahead. It seemed like the only option in a place where there was nothing. And if you knew Cape Breton at the time, then you know what I'm talking about. I don't know what it was like for other age groups, but for mine, coming of age in Cape Breton, identity felt something of a Janus face, depending on who was assessing you. So whatever the truth of it, one side of the face, the newspaper and television reports often showed what looked like an industrial wasteland. The tar ponds in Sydney became famous for being the largest toxic waste site in North America. People were getting sick. Unemployment was rife. Buildings were boarded up. Smoke choked the air. Dirty-faced men in hard hats went to dirty-looking jobs that they said they were desperate to keep. People were often angry on TV. Interviews with them highlighted their regional accents that the rest of the the country found funny, a joke. After all, as sad as it was, everyone wanted these industries shut down. They were too expensive to subsidize and limp along with taxpayer money. They were outdated. They should have been gone ages ago. They'd be like, Cape Breton wants to preserve its way of life. And you'd be like, like this? <laughs> they want to preserve this? On the flip side, you had just as strong an image of the tourist industry that promoted Cape Breton as a musical bucolic paradise. This is a tourist commercial from the exact same time. Around every corner, a vista of green and blue, a fiddler, a fishing boat, a dream. Here the accents delight. The island beguiles and enchants. In this one, you, the islander, are this, the folk of Ian McKay. There are no smokestacks. The tourists are told not to go to Sydney. <laughs> <laughs> That's our village. I'm not from industrial Cape Breton. I'm, I'm not from the coal mines and Sydney steel and the tar ponds. I'm from the rural side being sold to tourists, literally here. But everyone in my family and my community has, uh, in rural areas has worked in or has family connections to mining, to factory work, to industry, whether that has been in industrial Cape Breton, Windsor, Sudbury, Elliott Lake, Detroit, Fort McMurray, wherever you had to go because the face of rural life is only a face. The reality is more complex. There was a documentary in the 1970s called The Vanishing Cape Breton Fiddler, and it made the case that all the fiddlers had disappeared from the island. They hadn't really. All the best ones were just working at Chrysler's car plant <laughs> in Windsor, Ontario. How bizarre to have these uh, two images competing for the mask that you wear in public, depending on which one people see when you tell them that you're from Cape Breton. I've had people light up, charmed, I've had also people immediately look down on me. I've also had many people not know where in the hell that is, so. <laughs> oh, there's more of these. Ducks begins in 2005 when I graduated university, but I graduated high school in 2001, and this was a particularly rough time for the Cape Breton history and economy. They were shutting everything down, and communities suffered. Here's some cool headlines for you. <laughs> everything was going. The pulp mill in Port Hawkesbury, Sydney Steel, the last coal mines on the island, my school was raised to the ground, even the post offices were closing. The grocery store that had employed my father had changed hands about three times in the past few years and was the only store left in town. Everything felt untenable. End of days. <laughs> End of days is a cool thing to wake up to. <laughs> when I was in grade 11, uh, in the last year before they closed my school, there were 23 kids in my grade, and there were seven in grade primary. It was like the population was just going off of a cliff. And we were told to leave, just leave. There's nothing for you here. There was a sense that young people were living out a life of options in other places, and you were just eking out the sputtering death of a statistic of what happens in these places. So I left. We all left. And so you would be forgiven for thinking that my story is one of a net cultural loss. If you read Ducks and felt a hole somewhere inside, I can't blame you for that. It's a difficult read. But it is a disservice to my community to let you think that way. So I want to close this talk with my beautiful truth. 
The truth being that I am here today with a career as an artist, as a cartoonist, a writer, and the whole nine yards because I am the beneficiary of a long history of a community that values art. And that is a working class legacy also. Art for no money, art for each other, art for shared history, for storytelling, for pleasure through hard times, art because it has value. In the working class, your body of labor is what it is. There are not many options, then the job is available and it's good and you have to take it. Your body has to take it, but your mind is a different story. In my life, I may have lacked confidence as anybody might. I might have worried that I was not as good as other people. I might compare badly with those who have more resources. But I never once questioned the value of my mind, and that is the gift of my community. Even as I ship my body out for unforgiving labor, I never felt like my voice wasn't worth something. Story is what we are all about, isn't it? And I have been telling you a story about Cape Breton for a while now, so let me tell you a different one. First of all, I should mention something about my culture in my small part of the province. Up until the recent past, where you see more diversity, it has been predominantly the culture of the settler Gale, people of Scottish descent but not Scottish. They were not the only ones. There has been a sizable Dutch population since World War II. There are names of loyalist origin. To the north and south, you will find Acadian communities, and to the east, Mi'kmaq communities. But in the enclave of communities from which I hail, there is a strong Gaelic presence, and that is the culture that I claim. So I'm speaking for myself when I talk about my community. The tourism industry that we have talked so much about built heavily on the romanticized version of these people, the tartans, the bagpipes, the mysticism, the dominance of this image at the expense of and purposeful erasure of other cultures, especially if they were not white. And it worked. Tartanism is hard to shake. Wow. But it was a package created for the consumption of the white middle class and foreign visitors who wanted to see kilts and had a mania for Bonnie Prince Charlie and Robbie Burns. It made caricatures of actual people who had never heard of Robbie Burns Day and never owned a kilt. Ugh, this is, I mean, wild. Their language, Gaelic, was not a sellable commodity uh, in the way that the image of a bagpiper was, so it was left to die in the vine. What does this say? Oh, the far coolins are pulling love on me as I step wee me chromag on that. Like, what? No. I say that all the time. Uh, <laughs> Anything that couldn't go on the cookie tin was not important, and anything that wasn't on the cookie tin was amended and slapped on. And it's still hard for people to separate the cartoon tartanism of Gaelic Nova Scotia with its commercial interests and its racial discomfort and its cringe and its ubiquity with the living people who have a culture and a history and are not a fabrication of corporate and conservative interest. And I think you guys can relate to this a little bit because you have your cowboy stuff. <laughs> Well, I've seen it around a little bit. <laughs> My husband is from Alberta, and he's like, yes, the farmers wear ball caps, and the like bank guys at the stampede wear the cowboy hat. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so when I speak of my culture, I know I'm contending with this image, this cringy stuff. So I thought I would state that outright because we've been talking so much about this. And I'm contending with Ian McKay. He's back too. So many callbacks. <laughs> McKay was so focused on taking down the folk, and his book became so popular that I think he helped create an atmosphere where depictions of rural settler cultures that aren't explicitly doing their bit to sufficiently upend the folk narrative are received with suspicion. There were never any folk, says McKay. There were only categories and vigorously redescribed, or if not invented, traditions that enabled us to think that there were. But people in quest of the folk are never not under the gaze of commodification of some kind. They never exist for themselves. If it looks quaint to the outsider, flag it, put it in the cultural construction bin. But there were real people and real cultures here long before the folklorists and the tourist industry. More came after. Nova Scotia is diverse and full of as much cultural truth for itself alone as it has been subject to or even participated in cultural construction for others. Do you remember the poet from before? Angus, my great, great, great grandfather? The one who wrote the crop failure song? He's not the only poet from around then. I mentioned his mentor, the locally famous Alan the Ridge MacDonald. Alan wrote a poem one time. He spent the night at his neighbor's house. When he woke in the morning, 
It was to the sound of a woman named Catherine singing to a baby in another room, her grandchild. And lying there listening, he would write a poem, a song in her praise. In the poem, or song, I guess it's a song, in the song he writes that he awoke to the steady, tranquil sound of her voice, which enthralled his mind and gladdened his heart. How true a friend she was, cheerful, singing to the child, more beautiful a sound than the birds on the tips of branches or of any stringed instrument. He praises her manner, her dignity, her husband and family, and in the end, he concludes with, I am well able to relate this. They were my good friends. It's very beautiful. I love this song. Catherine, the woman, I have her name. These many generations later, she is my great, 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 great grandmother. She should be lost to time for all that her station in life was. She could not read or write. We know she was a small woman. She had not a word of English. But she comes alive because the poetry of her people was a poetry of community. And aren't I fortunate for that? That's a treasure for me to know the ways that beauty, love, and connection have always been a part of life. People really like to punt around their opinions of the Gaelic language, but it is for me to decide how much this means to me, and it means a lot. It's mine. Here's another story. I was, I was jealous of the musicians because music talent was such a prize. There's always famous fiddle players and the like, and you might know some famous fiddle names yourself, but it's only in the last uh, 20 years or so that you could actually make a career of it. And before that, even the most genius musicians either worked uh, at something else or they lived in poverty if that's all they were doing. But they were revered as legends, and they were legends. They knew more about music than you could ever imagine. Not just how to play it, but to make it, the lore around it, and they could tell the style from one village to another where you only heard the same sound. They would say that music was in you, that it followed a lineage, that it was in your family, that it was natural. It didn't have to be, but it was often found in families. Particular talent, fiddlers, piano players, singers and dancers cropping up like carrots in a patch. We are not the only Beatons around. There are plenty of Beatons, and some of them are famously musical Beatons. Not mine. <laughs> it was still something special for music and dance to be so treasured, even if I had two left feet and fiddles and pianos turned to dust in my hair. But I brought my future husband, to his first square dance at one point when he was visiting me years ago, right a passage, you might say. And the crowd was chatting, and the news in the room was that Joe Rankin was back home. And there was anticipation that he was gonna dance that night. You see, at one point in the square dance, there's this event where the floor clears completely, and the best dancers go in one by one to do some steps. It's like a showcase. Everyone else is jammed along the walls watching this massive empty floor with one lone dancer. You can imagine. <laughs> and at last, that part of the night came up, and Joe Rankin stepped into the clearing to dance. And people are pumped. <laughs> and my husband turned to me, and he was like, is that him? And I said, yes. And the man that everyone had been waiting for was a man in his 50s who looked like he worked in construction. Because he does. He does work in construction. He's wearing white pants, like you do when people are going to look at your legs. <laughs> and if my husband was a little confused, the people around us breathe, God, he's such a good dancer. <laughs> like his mother, oh, it's in his people. And they're nodding, and they're into it, yes. And I like that story, because Joe works in construction in Alberta, like so many people do. And his body does reflect the years of labor that are his life. But at home, his value, his history, is the music that's in him. Like so much that they clear the floor for him. And again, I think that's so beautiful, and I love it. I don't even think that I would have noticed that that was even a happening, really. That there was anything special about it, if my husband wasn't there to point it out. Why this unconventional man should be a star that night, but he was. I was like, oh, yeah, Rankins, oh, they all dance. <laughs> we had so much art around us in different forms. Wit and humor were prized. 
when I was interviewed about making comics, when I was doing humor comics, people often asked, like, where do you think the humor came from? And I was always like, home. But uh, it was hard to get into it. How do you explain humor? All you knew from a young age was that you wanted to be as funny as the people around you. You wanted them to notice you. Lyndon McIntyre put it this way. He said, every kid grows up wanting the favorable attention of an adult. And the best way to get it is to play the fiddle. If you can't play the fiddle, you have to tell the story. So there's an oral tradition passed between generations embedded in stories from simple, ordinary lives. Turning that into something that holds attention puts a high premium on clever speech and humor. You learn to embellish anecdotes from daily living and make them entertaining enough so that people remember you. Hmm? Bang on. Lyndon knows what he's talking about. I made a career in comics already by the time that his second novel, The Bishop's Man, won the Giller Prize. I don't think it was a surprise to anyone, but there was a lot of pride. We had all watched him host an acclaimed national investigative news program, the Fifth Estate, for as long as I can remember, never lost his accent. When his writing career took off to similar acclaim, a national award just felt like giving the king his flowers. But I feel like this quote about where storytelling comes from, culturally, I recognize it. He's only from down the road, you know? <laughs> <laughs> If you were good with humor, you could almost be immortal. But believe me when I say that people stop me, even only days ago, someone stopped me. I had an armload of, of grocery bags coming into the grocery store. And someone stopped me to tell me something funny that my grandparents said one time. And these are people who died in 1994 or 1986. And they were like, you want to know this funny story? And they do it just because they remember it and they thought I'd like to know, and I do, I do wanna know. Maybe we didn't get the music in my family, but we had the stories and the humor and everyone knew it. And it made me feel like I had it and that I could do it. And I did. Confidence in numbers through time. Affirmation, it felt like a way of being seen. When I was a teenager working in that museum in my village, we were visited all the time by people looking for their ancestors. A name, a story, a location. But they were sometimes searching for something more than that. They were searching for something inside of themselves, that they felt lost to time and distance, connection, identity, everything we took for granted because you can't throw a stone without hitting a fiddler and you can't tell a story without including six people by a nickname and a patronym that's three names long that everyone completely understands. I have a family of cousins where some go by the patronym and some by the nickname. Donald Angusay, Joey Angusay, Dougal Angusay, and Jack Stretch. Is that confusing? No, Jack is tall and slim. Makes perfect sense. <laughs> Stories, music, poetry, dance, humor, all of these things kept a tiny corner of the world connected through generations. I'm informed and enriched by it. It's about finding value in each other, and so in yourself it gives you strength. Or to borrow from my musical kin, it is mellifluous, if I said that right. I'm not a musician. It is to be in tune with something. I liked living in the big cities of the world. I enjoyed it very much, but I moved home eventually because I know myself here. I feel like a version of myself that I like the most. Other people know me. They may also know generations before me. And when I tell a story, I'm pulling from the strength of something deep inside, of a woman who can't read or write singing to her grandbaby early in the morning with a clear and beautiful voice, a man who is poor and keeps a sense of humor about it in poetry and song, a revered dancer with the body of a construction worker, a fiddler who is a composer and a genius pulled from the middle of making hay to play at a wedding, a cartoonist who wants to be as funny as the people around her and tell stories because that is who I am and that is who we are. I write, I make art, I know who I am, and I am grateful for the story within my community which taught me that I had a voice that mattered, that culture belonged to me with power and authenticity as it should to us all. Thank you. <laughs>